Hey guys, so two cool things happened to me over the weekend. The first was that I went to a cubing competition for the first time in around five years, which was crazy and a blast. Um, and the second is that I was cleaning out some boxes in my parents' basement and I found a box here labeled cubes on it. And at the competition, you know, I was meeting lots of new people, but I was also seeing people who have been in the community and I've known them for five plus years, maybe even 10. And one of the things that we talk about a lot are those like nostalgic feelings of what the cubing community was like five to 10 years ago, what cubes we solved on, what stores were popular, like all that sort of stuff. Um, so I thought it would be really cool to go through this box I've taken a peek just to verify that it is indeed cubes in here, but I think it would be cool to go through this box. I kind of hope it's a bit like a time capsule and see what's in there. See if there's any like legendary puzzles. Um, I'd probably put this box away maybe like four years ago and I know it's not the only box I have. So if this is interesting, hopefully, I can go find some more cube boxes and dig through those as well. Anyways, let's get into the box and see what's in there. Oh, all right, right off the bat, this probably has to be, um, I, I, it's probably one of the cubes I'm most proud of. Um, so let's pause on this for a second. Um, this, is a Diane Zanchi. So, you know, the cube alone is like one of the greatest of all times. It was one of the first cubes to solve the issue of popping. It did so using this mechanism. Here's a corner and an edge. Uh, so this right here is a torpedo. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. And this would just lock in to the corner piece here and basically prevent it from shooting out of the puzzle. So yeah, it's gotta be one of Diane's most sold puzzles ever, if not for sure the most sold. Um, during, like when I was first starting to learn how to cube, um, this was, you know, the best cube you could get. Um, so this was my first speed cube. I went from a Rubik's cube to this. This wasn't my cube. The one I got was actually a white. Um, white plastic Zanchi, but this is in my opinion even cooler. So this is a force cube and it is part of the first batch of force cubes. So back, I don't even know how many years, maybe eight years, something like that. Uh, stickerless cubes were just starting to um, kind of become popular. And the reason people liked stickerless cubes um, was because of how they felt. So everyone would pick up a stickerless cube and it felt like it was smoother, like you could turn faster than you could with a black or a white puzzle. So there were plenty of debates online about this, about whether or not it actually was faster or if it was just placebo. Um, but I was one of those where I would solve on the sticker list and be like, oh my gosh, like I'm so much faster on this cube. I loved the feel of it, blah, blah, blah. But stickerless cubes were illegal in WCA competitions. Um, and I think the logic at the time was that when you turned the piece, um, like an edge piece, 45 degrees, you could see what the color was on the other side. Um, I don't know if that actually impacts solves, but that was, I think, the general consensus at the time as to why it was not allowed. There was another YouTuber, uh, her name was Camille, um, the algorithmist, who had the idea to take um, six stickerless Sanchis, disassemble them um, into all their components, so take, away, take apart each piece in the cube, and then reassemble um, a fully red cube, a fully blue cube, a fully 
yellow cube, etc. And you'd end up with six cubes that were solid color. And then if you stickered those, now you were able to have a cube that has the stickerless plastic, right? So you still get the same speed and the same feel, but it's stickered, so it's legal in WCA competition. And it's solid colored, of course. And you get cool looking cubes, new color waves. So she came up with this idea and um, pitched it to me and my friend, uh, Curtis. We basically decided to sell these. And at the time I was running a cube store called E3 Cubes Canada, um, which was a branch of a cube store, E3 Cubes, which was run by a guy named Evan Jennings. Throwback if you remember all of that, that's forever ago. Um, and yeah, we started selling these and this, they like blew up. Like there were video after video on YouTube and we started selling internationally for the first time. Like we were getting sales from countries all over the world. I'll make a video about force cubes separately because I could talk about this for an hour. Um, but yeah, I cubed with this cube specifically forever and yeah, it just holds a special place in my heart from all the hours uh, Curtis and I spent making them and yeah, working with Camille on them. It was, it was really cool. All right, let's see what is next. Ah, okay, so here is um, another force cube from the first batch. Looks like I kept one with all of the original um, stuff. So this is actually um, how we would ship a lot of the force cubes is we'd ship them DIY. And this is something cube manufacturers don't do anymore and I just forgot that they used to. But you used to be able to buy DIY cubes. So you could get a Zanchi that was do it yourself and you assembled it all and as a result it was cheaper. But let's take a look at what's inside. All right, so the classic Diane box. We were just reminiscing about this at the cubing competition. There's the cube designer hugging all his cubes and giving the peace sign, love it. There's a little like Diane logo sticker there. Zanchi. Yeah, this was before cubes would come in like ginormous boxes with a million things. In these days, the cube just came with uh, the cube. And also there was a Zanchi ID card, but I'm not seeing that in here. Here is the OG Force Cube logo. Gotta love it. Not the best printed logo, but nostalgic, brings back memories. And then a pack of, I think these are like, Z sticker Fulbrights, I believe. There's pink in there, um, but yeah, good times. And then of course the cube itself. There's those torpedoes I was talking about. And there is the Zanchi core. Very, very cool. Good times. <laughs> um, this was for a video I made a long time ago where I actually went and made Force Mega Minxes. So once we created the Force Cube, um, it sort of became the name for when you take six stickerless puzzles and turn them into stickered puzzles. Yeah, so this is an X-Men Galaxy. Another, another Force Cube. This one was not one of the OGs and it was re-stickered, but yeah, that's a green one. That's four force cubes so far. Got some magnets for magnetizing puzzles when we would have to do that on our own when manufacturers didn't do it. Oh, this is so gummy, it's terrible. And the stickers are awful too. This looks like it has like the OG can cube logo. This is probably a MoU of some sort, but wow, is it ever gummy. Super basic mechanism and absolutely full of sticky lube. It's gross. Yeah, it's got a blue core in there. So I'll double check, I'll put it up on screen which cube it is, but very cool. Ooh. This one's super old. 
Super old. So this is an original plastic white uh, Zanchi 2x2. Two two. It's beat to heck, but that sound. Ah, oh, damn, it's still really good. And all, all the stickers are all wrecked on it. I remember a few years back, the Zanchi 2x2 two two was like super desirable. Uh, like people were paying a decent amount of money to get used Sanchi 2x2s two um, just because of how just because of how good I think the plastic is and how it turns it's such a deep sounding puzzle yeah this is a really really cool one it's super expensive I think this cube cost $200 maybe even $300 um, and it has a broken corner piece, as you can see. Um, so this is a custom, um, a custom cube that I was working with, um, a friend on, his name's Cole, and he was designing a cube for me. Um, I wanted to, this is right when magnets were first starting to take over, um, where we were custom magnetizing puzzles, just like this one here. Um, and we wanted to make it so that you could customize the magnetic strength in your cube. So we had edge pieces that had um, edge to corner magnetization in them, but also um, edge to center. And then the idea was that uh, we would create uh, center caps that had um, a pass through for magnetization and each center cap you know, each cube would basically come with a set of center caps and you would swap out the center caps um, in order to change the magnetization of the cubes. So you might get like three sets of center caps and each of them are varying in strength. Uh, and then, oh, this is gonna be hard. And then you could basically just swap out the center caps whenever you wanted to increase the strength. But anyways, this was before um, manufacturers started magnetizing puzzles on their own um, and yeah it was it was so expensive because it had to be um, resin 3d printed so we did different versions where we were using a regular SLA 3d printer um, is that the right term I'm not entirely sure but it's like layer by layer 3d printing um, but in order to actually get the proper feel of the cube um, we needed to do resin. And honestly, uh, it's not the worst thing I've ever felt. Uh, <laughs> we were getting there for sure, but um, it still catches a lot internally. So the mechanism wasn't quite there yet, um, but it was getting closer. And yeah, now cubes just come with all of their crazy magnetization options, so. Uh, this one never made it to market, but still really, really cool. I don't have a name for it, or we never named it, but um, yeah, I don't know. This is a cool one and an expensive one. Like I said, two to three hundred dollars on this. Kind of wild. All right, what else we got? Ooh, we got a Diane Megaminx with ridges. I'm gonna move this back. So I got some room to actually turn the puzzles here. Um, it's like yellowing. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's like yellowing around the edges, kind of gross. Uh, and the sticker's really peeling back, but yeah, um, it feels a lot worse. Uh, and it's so tight, oh my God, and it's dry in there, it's gross. Um, yeah, these feel so much better right now. Damn, um, yeah, I don't know, nothing too much to say about this, to be honest, uh, but it's definitely a beaut. All right, another one that's yellowing. It's very yellow. I don't know if that's coming off in the video. Okay, this feels like a budget cube for sure. Super loud, the shades are weird. There's no logo on it. 
And you can see how the torpedo design of the Zanchi, you know, made it through to future cubes. Um, really cool. I wonder if this was intentionally hollow or if it, a piece fell out, because this one's not hollow. Just pulled this one out of the box, unsolved. Looks, uh, I was gonna say it looks a little, like it could be not budget. Hmm. Yeah, definitely not my favorite cube. The no logo on it doesn't help assess what it is. Um, we got edge ridges. We got that same kind of like hollowed out corner again. I'm trying to figure out if these are the same cube, but clearly, clearly they're not. Um, but there are similarities, like this hollowed out uh, foot of the corner. That looks pretty close. Um, but that's, I mean, these are sort of similar, but I feel like a lot of cubes look like that. So, I don't know. I'll put it up on the screen if I know what it is. And if I don't find it, let me know in the comments what you think it is. All right, next up. We got a Pira. Again, no logo. We got ball bearings though. So, so back in the olden days, before Chris Tran thought to put magnets in cubes, um, Pira mixes used ball bearings. Um, I think Scubes did as well to lock uh, their turns into place. So you'd have a little dimple in the cube there in the edge piece and that would click into place. Next up is the wingy. This is um, still used today. So I think this is just the V1 when it first came out. Um, but in the five years that I haven't really touched this, I have forgot how to scoop. What else we got? Oh, okay. <laughs> so this was V1 of this one here. So, wow, look at that. Oh, it's so bad. I mean, oh. So yeah, let me show you the difference for why we spent so much money on this cube when we already had this one 3D printed. So, I mean, there are different designs, but also, um, I don't know if you can see how poor the print quality is on the black piece here. Um, when you're 3D printing with the printers that are just doing layer by layer, um, the quality of the print like you can see those layers, right? Which means that when you're turning the cube, it feels like sandpaper versus this, which is just nice and smooth um, because there's no layers um, that are like, well, there are, but they're much finer. And yeah, super cool. No. Uh I just broke another edge piece or another corner piece. Sad. All right, well, we'll move that off to the side and I'll fix that later and hopefully I don't break this one as well. Um, but yeah, this was uh, one of the, I think this was the first one that we got fully printed all together. Again, this was Cole's design. Um, and yeah, and then it was cool to get this one done. And this one obviously just felt so much better. Um, oh, super cool. <laughs> Next up, we got a ton of lube and glue for making maple cubes. So in maple cubes, we used like Angstrom, we used DNM, the original ones, and we used tons and tons of glue um, to magnetize the puzzles. Hilarious how much is still in there. 
Ooh, another 3D printed um, version. This one feels a lot more put together than this one here. So this one was probably like V1 and then Damn, you know, it's really not bad. Okay, I mean, it catches a lot. It catches a lot, but <laughs> very cool. Very, very cool. So yeah, it was probably this one then this one, and then that one right there that's now in pieces. Sad, but still super cool to see the evolution of that. Got some of the OG Maple Lube. So we sold this for a little while um, and used this in all of the Maple Cubes as well. It's pretty good stuff. Ooh, another throwback, wow. This is cool. Um, so this one is not super, super old. It's probably, um, I don't know, from like 2017, 2018. But this was a special edition of Cubes that we ran with Eric Limeback. So that's his signature there, E-Lime. Um, yeah, Eric is a friend of mine and also a legend in the Canadian uh, speed cubing scene for many things. Um, and I believe this was a GTS2 setup to how he liked his cube setup. Got his signature and then the little can cube logo. And then we also have two cards in here. So then we have this here which is the Limeback GTS 2M by CanCube. And it looks like this is the fifth one that was made. I don't think we made too many of these at all. So very, very limited. And then we have a little thank you card. It says, thank you so much for purchasing one of five limited edition Limeback GTS 2M puzzles. So there you go, there were five of them. This project has been in the works for quite some time now and we're really proud of the final product. This puzzle is intended to be crazy fast and super smooth. That being said, due to transit, it might take a solve or two to reach maximum performance. Once you've played around with it, let us know what your final thoughts are. Thanks again and enjoy. And then we have Jack, who um, was responsible for a lot of stuff at CanCube, um, including this project making the cubes, he made a lot of maple cubes as well. He's a legend. And then Eric as well. So super, super cool. All right, and now for, whoa, okay. It is very fast. And very smooth. Wow, it's been in a box for like five years. Jeez, definitely the best cube I've pulled out of this whole thing so far. Um, geez, I honestly can't believe it was gummy. Like even in the card that we included in it, we were like, hey, you know, it might be a little gummy out of the box, but this was not at all. Very, very cool. And I think these ones we magnetized ourselves as well. Um, I could be wrong there though. Very cool. Wow, I'm so glad I have this in all of the original packaging and it's mostly untouched and still looking pretty. That's super, super cool. Ooh, okay, these are cool. Yeah, so this was um, the largest order that I had in CanCube history. What basically happened was Fidelity Investments, they're this huge finance firm. They reached out on CanCube's website in like the contact us form. And they were basically like, hey, do you guys make custom cubes? To which I was like, no, we, we don't. I mean, 
the maple cube was as custom, the maple cubes were as custom as we got. So um, I was gonna message her back and say no, but on second thought, a friend convinced me to say yes and basically figure it out. And essentially they wanted to order a bunch of cubes that were custom. Originally they wanted fully custom stickers, but eventually they settled on just wanting the custom Fidelity logo. So we got Fidelity in just plain text printed on a logo um, and then applied to all of these pure mixes. So Fidelity's big logo um, that they have on most of their stuff is a pyramid, which is why they wanted this. And they were releasing a new fund. Um, I hope I can expose all of this. I, I don't know if it's confidential or not. Um, so we had to figure out how to get, I know it seems trivial, but like we had to get a manufacturer to agree to custom logo all of these pyraminxes. Um, then we had to find a supplier to uh, create these little inserts for each of the boxes. Fidelity investment grade total bond currency neutral fund. And then a little bit on the back. And then um, someone to make these boxes as well. But of course, none of this came together. So um, all of my friends stepped up huge and we basically turned my college, my university, um, house with all my roommates and we turned it into a factory for a weekend and we basically just created a line of us where we were taking the cubes out of their original boxes and then creating these boxes and then inserting them and I think we did 3,000 puzzles and then I delivered them to Fidelity in my parents minivan um, so I don't know, kind of hilarious, like the whole situation. Like I was blown away that they were interested in working with me, some like university student, like, yeah, I don't know. It was just wild and all my friends like chipped in and it was such a good time. Very, very cool. Um, so that's it. We've reached the bottom of the box. Yeah, so that's it guys, that was the nostalgia box of all of the old cubes. Hopefully I didn't go on too long-winded and bore you with the stories, um, but that was a lot of fun for me. Hopefully I can find some more boxes of cubes buried. I know I have tons more that are much older than these. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you guys in the next one.